repeat the non-conformist oath. I promise to be different. I promise to be different. I promise to be unique. I promise to be unique. I promise not to repeat things other people say. Welcome back to Positive Blatherings and another episode. There you go. Next one over. Oh, two from your side. Oh, it's it's two either way. <laughs> this one? Yeah, yeah. There we go. All right, I'm all set now. I You have to crank them up like me. Absolutely. I'm almost deef. That, Craig, that comes with age, you know. Yeah, I know, I know. That and uh, wearing headphones too much yes. in the course of your career. And being a mobile DJ, cranking up the music kind of doesn't help much either. No, not at all. Craig Spazman Simmons. Yes, sir. In, in the house. And uh, I'm so glad that you were able to make trip out from Shortsville. Not very far. I could have walked. <laughs> yeah, I wouldn't have. It would have taken so, about three hours. But. Yeah, you could have. Could have got here. Um, but it's good to have you here. And uh, I love what you've been doing with uh, Chosen Spot Radio. Thanks, man. And uh, your dedication to the youth sports in the area. Yeah. That's, that's really cool because I'm sure there's a lot of people that really appreciate what you're doing with that. A lot, yes. Yeah. Um, and it, it, that's one of the greater aspects of what I do when somebody comes up and says, I was on the road in Texas and listened to the game, or a parent comes up and says, my, yeah. my mother loves listening in Florida, or a dad says, I'm going, on, I was on vacation and I was listening on the airplane over the Atlantic. You know, yeah. it, it, listen, nobody's getting rich doing it, but at the same time, the payment is also like you said, good vibes and uh, the yeah. community, the community, yeah. Canandaigua and surrounding areas. We get up this way. We get up to Fairport every now and then. And, you know, it's a cool thing, man. And you and you do you do like play by play for. Yeah. Other for other teams, if, even if it's not on Chosen Spot Radio, you'll like be a play by play guy or is it always on? No, it's your... I, Chosen Spot Radio is my thing. It's an yeah. online station and yep. we focus primarily on Canandaigua, which is the Chosen Spot. Right. So we pr- focus primarily on that. I do go in surrounding areas. Hey, you know what it's all about here in radio? Revenue. If I can get the revenue, mm-hmm. I'll go wherever. If if you're if you're paying, I'm playing. But I also do it for <laughs> several area radio stations, AM, FM and uh rock sports right. network which is you know they're, they're starting to become a big player that's in the that's uh, that's gary's gary's uh yes. baby is gary sagdak say yeah. <laughs> but Sadak. that's how you how you spell it yeah uh, and then you i have also heard you on on whack whack radio 1420? 1420 wack whack radio i yeah. wish they'd play that up a little bit more you know but uh the whack you're on the whack listening to the whack <laughs> i know that's Let's a gold get mine. whack on 14 you know but uh <laughs> he's he's you know he's he's a conservative guy so he's not going to go for it. So speaking of whack, let's go back in time sure. and let's talk about you were a wrestler. Yes, speaking you were, of being whack. Speaking of being whack, yeah, you were a the, pro wrestler. Yes, that that is how the the name and the lifestyle of Spazman came to be. Do you remember the movie Meatballs? Yeah. And they had the character in there, the nerdy character Spaz. 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 Well, he had the tape on his glasses. Yeah. So they used to and and Back in the day, I didn't have two nickels to rub together, man. So I, you know, just used to tape my glasses all over the place. I was working the produce department at Wegmans, and they used to call me Spaz. So my first wrestling uh, gig was coming up August 31st of 1989 in Geneva at Old Moon's Tavern. Used to be a bowling alley, Hmm. the way out in the back. And uh, a girl I was crushing on, her name was Sunday. I love you, my wife, Lisa. I love you. But this is way, <laughs> way, way before we met. So she knows about her. But Sunday, I was talking to her. She came by to b- visit me at the beverage center I was working at. And I told her I had my wrestling first wrestling gig coming up. And I couldn't come up with a name. And she said, well, you're Spaz. What about Spaz Man? Sold. And <laughs> the rest is history. There it is right there, man. And... uh here we go. So, how long did you do that for? How long did you wrestle? I think I wrestled right up until 1990, about 97, 98 when I was diagnosed with an autoimmune disease, sarcoidosis. I remember the doctor came in and said, "I've got good news and bad news." And the good news is is you, you don't have cancer. It's nothing, you know, terminal, mm-hmm. but you're you're done with wrestling and you're done with all kinds of stuff. So, I did it for probably 10, 11 years. And then after that, I 
delved into other areas of wrestling. I became what's known as a booker. You know, I helped set up matches. I became yeah. an agent. I helped. I was a heel, which is the bad guy. And at Suplex U, which was a place that New Millennium Wrestling used to run in Rochester, uh, I used to teach the kids how to be heels and, you know, how to be a that's heel. That's the bad, the bad guy in, that's the, in the wrestling That's the bad game. guy, yeah. yeah. That's, that's, but Steve Austin kind of changed the whole you know, he'll be the bad guy being the bad guy thing. And people started, now the line is really blurred between good guy and bad guy. Mm. You know, used to be in wrestling, you could tell the people what they're supposed to think. Now, not so much. The psychology has kind of gone out of the game. But anyway, to walk it back, yeah, that's uh, <laughs> that's that's about 11, 12 years wow. altogether. How was the, what was the experience like doing that kind of, doing that kind of work? It was awesome. It was awesome, man. I loved it. I, I'm an entertainer. I came from a dysfunctional family, Fitz, okay? And I escaped from that into reading and uh, television and movies and things like that. Mm -hmm. And if you recall, you ever watch The Munsters? Yeah. You remember the Zombo, uh, the Zombo episode where no. Eddie loved this Zombo, this zombie character, and then he found out that the guy... That it was an actor who played Zombo. Oh, you know, and yeah, and he's yeah. like, "Wow, Zombo's kind of a jerk," and you know that kind of thing. <laughs> yeah. Well, that opened my eyes to, "Wow, what's what's this all about?" So I started delving into things that were going on behind the scenes and backstage and all mm -hmm. that good stuff. So early on, I knew I wanted to be an entertainer, and um, like I say, used my imagination to get away from that whole dysfunctionality thing that I had going on as the quintessential redheaded stepchild. Ah, yes, and then. Um, Henry Greco is a guy who lived in Geneva. He and I had a little bit of a falling out one night at the Starlight. I don't know if you remember that place in Canadagua. It was before uh, my time. Got into a little bit of a scrap, and uh, he, he won. I was kind of you know inebriated at the time. And I was dumb and accepted a challenge to do something to him, and he turned around and you know gave me a nice little shot. But anyway, he's a guy <laughs> that got me involved in it, and uh, I loved it. I'll tell you, Rowdy Roddy Piper. I love the guy. Yeah. See, a lot of people think Hulk Hogan is what an, an MTV and remember Saturday night's main event. They think Hulk Hogan's the one that put wrestling on the map. Well, without Roddy Piper to go against Hulk Hogan, it never would have happened. And if you remember anything about Roddy Roddy Rowdy Roddy Piper, he was the quintessential heel. Yeah. And I knew right then and there when I went to see my first wrestling match, I knew that I was going to want to do it. And and it was awesome. It was awesome. It's a good time. You get it. Sure, you get injured. In my first match, I got bruised and cracked ribs. I mean, you get injured. You get hurt. No big deal. You just you live with it. You know, never went to the big time. Never tried out to the big time. And I'll tell you why, Fitz. Because they fly everywhere. I don't fly. And you don't fly. I do not fly. If I can't drive, I'm not going. Really? Yes. And they fly everywhere. And... Then I met my lovely wife, and we started a family and actually had an opportunity to go try out for ECW. I don't know if you know anything about ECW. That was the more extreme championship wrestling. I had a chance to go try out for them, and I passed on it. You know, I just said, nah, I don't want to spend the time away from my family. So, so family, <laughs> was, family was uh, number one for you at that point, and it was, yes. it was more important yeah. than that, that old dream. Yeah, I, but, did, I didn't want to be on the road all the time. But you... you you picked up a lot of talents that, well, maybe you unearthed or, or, you know, uncovered a lot of talents that you had inside yourself when you were doing the wrestling. 100%. You know, now uh, uh, one of the things I do is theater. And I think the two, I liken the two because in a wrestling match and in theater, you don't, and I'm also an, an actor. I've done movie and television. Mm -hmm. And in movie and television, you could say cut and redo it. Yeah. Uh, let's do it again. In theater and in wrestling, you don't. Right. And, and that is one of the things that turned me on to wrestling was the dramatic effect. You know, a lot of people say, oh, it's just it's just a soap opera for men. That's not a <laughs> Is that an insult? That's not a bad thing. You know, guys need that kind of thing, too. Now, granted, I haven't watched it in a long time because, uh, you know, I just walked away from it and moved yeah. on to different things. Yeah. But, uh yeah, I was big into it for a while there, and like I said, it was it was awesome. I was in great shape, and it, it, it listen, you get paid for beating up on people, <laughs> you know. And and I I worked what they call stiff. I I didn't pull punches. I I, I threw potatoes at you. I was going to pop you, but here's the thing, pop me right back. There's a lot of workers that are like that, stiff workers. They they don't pull, but 
you have to give it right back to them just as hard as they give it to you. Now, when you go when you would go into a match, would that be common knowledge? Is that something that you would discuss with the opponent? Would be like, hey, or you just had a reputation? Like, uh, oh, the, by the, the way, the, this guy doesn't pull his the punches. Repu- the reputation precedes you. Yeah. People, people know how you work. Yeah. You know, people know how you work, and the word gets out, and it gets around, and it makes for a better match. That's why the Jap- I think people <clears> like the Japanese form of wrestling so much is because it's more quote-unquote real versus you mean like sumo no 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 no. the wrestling the wrestling but they don't pull punches they they are beating the snot out of each other and um you know it's it's quote unquote predetermined but they're still beating the snot out of each other you know (laughs) i mean come on people listen any grown man can look and see what's going on you know (laughs) but uh you know what when you're watching a movie you're watching a Bruce Lee movie. Do you stand up? Does anybody stand up and go, that's staged. That's not real. Right, right. During a fight scene? Right, because no. you know it's not. Exactly. So why yeah. do it during wrestling? That's a that's but, a very good point. That's a very good point. <laughs> well, I've had this argument a few times. So yeah, or this, you were this, prepared this, for that one. Had this conversation a few times. I think the one that shuts everybody up, though, is, yeah, have you ever wrestled? No? Well, come and try me for five minutes, and then we'll see if you change your attitude about it. I've and, heard that one before. Yeah, and I've, it, I've heard it people works. say that. Yeah, It works. Hey, never mind. I'll take your, I'll take yeah. your word for it. Yeah. I'm good. Yeah. Um, so we fast forward again. because That's why this is called the blathering, because I just jump around. I, Fitz, just I'm the guy for around. that, because I'll take you everywhere, left, right, up, down, in, and out. I'm, <laughs> I'm good with that. I'm, uh, I'm not into organization. So, <laughs> so I first... Um, met you when you came into the radio station to do you did a segment yeah i think on your film uh, on never ne- too never late. too yeah. late yep that you shot what was that 2014 2015 uh, 15 15 15 yeah and that is about teen suicide yes teen suicide depression and and um shutting people out and 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 it was dramatic. Mm-hmm. It was dramatic. It was a drama. It wasn't a biography or a documentary. So that's why, you know, people are like, hey, can you get this in schools and this and that? No, because I don't conform to the Hollywood terminology that should or shouldn't be used. And, uh, you know, the quote unquote associations and organizations and medical, yeah. all that stuff. Yeah. But um, I, I, I'll tell you what, Fitz, I was going to see. We are still here. It's a movie that I had a scene in, and yeah. that's a pretty big independent film. That yep. was number one on iTunes, mm-hmm. not just number one independent, but number one horror movie on iTunes and Amazon for a couple of weeks for a little while. But we were on the way to Boston, the Underground Film Festival in Boston, the mm-hmm. Buff, to see the uh, Northeast premiere. And on the way, I heard about another ten year old that had killed himself, had committed suicide because he was bullied. And I said, you know, I told my wife, I said, I've, I've got to do something about this. I, I, I'm going to try and use my abilities and talents to maybe put a film together and direct it. And it just came together and we had some great actors in it and some great people involved and mm-hmm. bada bing, bada boom. Yeah. I mean, and, and that's what was really impressive to me is because you essentially came out of like not really doing that kind of work, not mm-hmm. really... I don't. How many scripts had you written before that, that were produced? That I you could count did? them on no fingers. There you go. Yeah. So you you had a you had an idea. And you said, "Here's a problem, and I am going to try to take what I know and use my abilities to do the best thing I can to combat this problem." And you made a film. You made a, a movie. Yeah. Well, fits. I I always what I what I used to say when you know at production meetings and when we were filming is we can be indifferent or we can make a difference. <clears throat> Mm. And I wanted to make a difference, and I, I like that. I, I, it's it's the truth. I think that's one of the one of the things lacking in today's society is we've indifference, and we've got to stop doing that. You can be indifferent or make a difference, and I wanted to make a difference, and it just came together. And like I say, I I had been doing some regional acting, and I knew some actors. I got Tyler Azer. Azer, she's gone. She's gone on to do really big things in modeling. A lot of modeling. She, yeah. She's moving up in the acting. I think more of her focus has been on the, the the modeling thing, but she's still doing both. Susan Azer, her mom, she is. Uh, she's not the quintessential, you know, backstage mom. She is involved. She wants to help. I couldn't do anything 
without her being there to you know offer help. Jesse Bell. Jesse Bell has gone on to do a lot. Is she, she down in Atlanta now? Or she, no, she's Nashville. in. Uh, she's in Tennessee. Tennessee, and she's moving up the ladder. Yeah, she I see that she's doing a lot. Of cool she did stuff. one of those. Uh, what what is that? She did like a Lifetime movie, a Hallmark movie, or she something. She did. She did a Lifetime movie. I think it was one of those movies. But she also did that. You know the the show where Snapped. She did the. I think she did a Snapped show. I don't, I'm not familiar with that. Well, it's it's you know they talk about people who you know act a pet crimes of passion. Oh, and things of that oh, nature. Okay. And uh, you know, so she's moving up. She starred in the movie, and in the movie, everything has a personal relate. Every every name of every character, every every number of a room, every everything in that movie has a personal relate, and uh, I, I'm really glad I had the opportunity to make it. I wanted to turn to do a trilogy. I've just been into so many other things. You are. I uh, yes, you're into I, a lot of things. I, we could talk for hours about that, Vince, <laughs> but. I haven't had the opportunity to go back. I haven't. Sh- I've shelved it. I haven't canned it. I haven't said we're not. going to You wanted do to do that. the next one. You wanted to do was about bullying. If I, I want to do it about bullying because, as yeah. per our conversation, you know, I look at things a little differently. I, I, I think just demonizing the bully, like we all have tended to do, how's that working out for us? Mm. It's not. Of course, we we want to demonize the bully, but there's three people that are accountable in this whole thing. The 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 bully the target and the um, observer okay all three of those people are accountable in this situation because if you call me a name it only matters if i believe it if you call me an a-hole i'm only that a-hole if i believe it otherwise i'm gonna i've ta- i taught my kids Feel sorry for those people because they have to demean you to feel good about themselves yeah. they have to put you down to build themselves up <laughs> yeah and if you see it you're either going to do nothing about it or you're going to act on it. So you you can become a witness or just be a bystander. That's why I say the observer, because the observer sees in it, sees it. If you don't do anything, you're a bystander. If you do something, you become a witness. And then the bully. Why is the bully being a bully? What is going on with that? So we can help the bully instead of just throwing them under the bus and demonizing them. Now, Fitz, let's be honest. There's just some bad seeds out there, man. Mm-hmm. But some kids can be helped. Some of them are doing it to because to, we they also, want attention. They well, we also have to be careful about what we are or are not referring to as bullying. Because that's a, true, I, and that I've seen that kind of come up a lot. Where I'm like, I wouldn't call that bullying. I'd yeah. call that just being a jerk. Yeah. Or, you know. <laughs> well, to me, I, I define bullying as as trying to make somebody else feel bad about themselves so you can feel good about yourself. And there's a dysfunctionality in that. There's an entire realm of dysfunctionality in bullying. Now, if I walk up to you and I hit you, you have a right to defend yourself. And I <laughs> If you walk you up to too. me and hit me, I'm going, I'm hitting the ground. <laughs> but you see where I'm coming <laughs> yeah. from? Yeah. And to me, there's yeah. a difference between bullying and assault. Okay, mm-hmm. assault, you have a right to defend yourself. How you defend yourself from bullying is with confidence. You have to be confident. And we don't teach that to kids. We don't give kids the tools, which is a whole other conversation we yeah. can have. It's, we're, yeah. not t- we're, we're raising an entire generation of victims. We're teaching kids to learn how to take a test. We're not teaching them how to deal with the real world. Yeah. I think there's a lot of, a lot of accuracy in that statement. Right on, man. And it's like everything. There's so many different uh, layers <laughs> there is I, I call it the three facets of bullying i call it the three facets yeah. the and I, I i don't call the individual who's being bullied i don't call them a victim mm. i call them a target you're a target of victim of, of bullying and i've heard that recently too that you're only a victim if you identify yourself you as a are, victim if you yes, believe you're a victim that's, some i just had a conversation with um I don't want to call her a millennial. I think she's younger than that. But she said that she's being victimized by Paw Patrol. And, I, and I'm like, Paw, I, Paw, Patrol, Paw Patrol? The show? Yes. And she's calling it misogynistic and, and demeaning and all of that. And I'm like, we find that which we seek, Fitz. If we look for a reason to be a victim, we're going to find a reason to be a victim. Mm-hmm. If we don't, Find a reason. If we don't want to be a victim, we're not going to be. Plain and simple. So, so this basically comes down to 
the character building of, of children as they're very, very young and to, you know, make them believe, help them to believe in themselves, yes. in their own inner strength to avoid the possibility of that happening when they're in a situation and someone decides to pick on them and they're like, you yeah, know, whatever. Also some empathy. We're not teaching kids empathy because empathy tells you maybe, maybe ask yourself, why is this kid being such a jerk? Why is this? What is yeah. going on in that you, kid's life or that kid's home that he's got to be this way? Do you think that that's something that that all kids can process? I mean, maybe as they get older and their later repetition teens, repetition fits. Yeah, repetition, repetition, my man. I say have, it one more time. I didn't get it. Repetition. <laughs> <laughs> I see what you did there. Listen, as a coach, as a coach. I do the same thing to begin every single basketball practice. Mm -hmm. I have them run the floor with a dribble, repetition. Mm -hmm. As a parent, I've, I've, I'm a father of four, a grandfather of three, repetition. You have to be consistent. You also have to be patient. There's nothing wrong with losing your patience and hollering at the kids. I, I tell you what, I'd rather have been hollered at than be told to go pick pick up a switch and you know yeah, yeah. that's how it was back in my day yep, yep. you had to go find they would send you to get and pick out to pick out the, the, pick out what they're gonna whoop your ass yeah. with excuse my french i don't know what the uh what the parameters are here for our uh, language no that's fine but, but uh <clears throat> so yes yeah yes they can process it we're teaching five-year-olds how to wrestle and a parent comes up and says isn't it too young to teach this kid how to wrestle i said Perhaps, but is it too young to teach this child how to be accountable? Is it too young to make sure this child is staying physically fit? Is it too young to teach this child how to work towards a goal and to stick with it? The life lessons that come along with sports. Mm. And see, we're going all over the place, but you know, it it, it fits within the realm of the posit positivity you yeah, know, aspects absolutely. of what you're doing here. So to, to walk it back, to answer your question... It's up to you to decide when you think your child is or isn't ready, but I certainly believe so because I have four of them. I have four of them, and they, I, I'm, I'm, you know, I pontificate a lot. I talk a lot. I am loquacious. I'm the monology, the verity of verbosity, my brother. I talk a lot, and you know I was giving it to him at a young age. <laughs> I knew it was going to be special having you on the blather. <laughs> so, <laughs> so after you did your film, um, I noticed you. So that's the, shortly after that is when you start started Chosen Spot, right? Um, yeah. Well, I started. I actually started Finger Lakes Online Radio. <clears throat> yeah. Okay. Yeah. And the reason I started Finger Lakes on radio, Online Radio, is because I am the kind of guy. I was told at a younger age. Well, if you don't like it. Why don't you just do it mm -hmm. as a football coach? Mm -hmm. All right. I had a couple things to say to a football coach uh, for one of my kids. And he says, well, if, if you think you could do better, how? why don't you do it? I'm like, okay, where do I sign up? Where do I sign up? <laughs> so, and I've been doing it for 20 years now. Yeah. And we're, I'm without, you know, toot my own horn too much. I think I'm pretty good at it, but, um, so I was working for other stations, and I thought to myself, yeah, I, I wouldn't do it that way. Mm. I, I probably would skip that, or I, it seems there isn't a lot of let's make it efficient. There isn't a lot of efficiency out there. There's more convenience than efficiency. efficiency and you, in my estimation, it's been my experience, you can't always have both. Okay? It might not be easy, but it's worth it. And um, I said, you know what? I'm going to do this myself. So I just did it to do it. I reinvent myself a lot. Fitz, that's uh, he stole the words so, right out of my mouth yeah. because that's exactly what I was going to say. I'm, I, it seems like you're constantly reinventing yourself. Yeah, but <clears throat> you're not reinventing a completely different version of yourself. You're sort of you're just reinventing one little. I don't even know if if reinventing is even the right word for it because you are still you. You're not. Mm -hmm completely changing you are it's almost like you're just expanding yourself 
You, you know I th- what I mean? I, th- I think what we're looking for here for, Fitz, is I challenge myself. There you I, go. I, I face there and you go. I accept at face and stare down challenge. Yeah. You can't run from challenge. Now, when you're diagnosed with an autoimmune disease and you think you're going to die, whether the doctor says you're going to die or not, and here comes a whole other aspect of this conversation. Mm. When you're diagnosed with a disease and you think – you're going to die. This is my last Christmas. You know, I'll never see my family, yada, yada, yada. It changes your thought process. When you when you first were diagnosed, is that what you thought? Is that what you were told or is that what no, you that, thought? No, that's not what I was told, but is that how you at, felt? at that point in my life, I wasn't the think positive guy that I am now, mm-hmm. which is, you know, we can walk it back and get into that whole thing. When the uh, transition happened, I can tell you exactly when it happened. But no, with the disease, and it, it was so enigmatic and vague at the time, it's called sarcoidosis. All right, S A R C O I D O S I S. And basically, so with the heart? Uh, uh, well, it's it, it starts in the lungs, and that's where it started with me, Fitz. I'm, I used to be called the human jack. Okay, I used to pick stuff up. I could I could literally pick up a gremlin while you change a tire, man. You know, back in the day, gremlins. And, and, yeah, I, <laughs> th- three on the tree, baby. Three on the tree. So, <laughs> I I thought to myself, this is it. Oh, I would walk up and down the flight of stairs. I was doing telecom stuff, pulling cable, and RJ forty fives, and you know, cats five and all that now what are they up to cat seven or whatever mm. but anyway um i get short of breath so i went to the doctor i said you know hook me up with a pill or something well he started palpating feeling around the groin area and he felt some uh what oh man lymph nodes and um that's part of it i lose the train of thought a little bit gets derailed a little but they pulled seem to be doing just fine they pulled out mm. lymph nodes that big fits and they're supposed to be the head or the size of a, a pinhead and he pulled one out that big and about three times the size of a shooter marble. And uh, and the rest is history. But, you know, you think to yourself, oh, man, this is it. This is it. Well, Fitz, you didn't ask, so I'll just go right to it. My dad passes away. Oh, sorry my, to hear that. My, my uncle passes away, who is the most influential individual in my life the very next day. I'm depressed. The day, the next day the after next your day dad died? After my dad passed away. They think he died before that, but they didn't find him. Oh, my gosh. Okay, so the the two most, you know, and my, my, my grandfather, he passed away not much long. So anyway, I'm depressed. So you had a lot of loss. I'm depressed. This. I'm I'm finding solace in uh, barley and hops. Let's put it that way. That's mm-hmm. the only sustenance I'm getting at that particular point in time. I'm doing the best I can to stay away from my kids. You know, I don't want them to feel the wrath. I don't want to uh, misdirect any of what I'm going through onto them. Sure. And they take that as dad doesn't love me. He doesn't want to be around. And that's not the case. I just wanted to be alone. Mm-hmm. Just, I just want to be alone. So I put myself in the hospital fits. The doctors told me if I had kept that up for about another week, uh, but with the disease and what I was going through, I probably would not have made it. So you putting yourself in the hospital saved your own life. It did not. It did not. It did not. What I realized, I call it, if you recall watching Never Too Late, the word epiphany mm-hmm. is very heavy in that. And again, I had an epiphany. I read an article about a tsunami where tens of thousands of people had died. I read an article about a gentleman in Victor, his six-month-old baby passed away due to heart problems. I thought to myself, my problems pale in comparison Mm. to what other people are going through. I turned why me into why not me. Everybody daily, my my grandmother gets diagnosed with cancer, dies. I'm losing family members, uh, friends and family and everybody, what they're going through. I thought to myself, I'm alive, man. I'm alive. What When you asked me how I'm doing when I came in today, what did I say to you? I'm glad to be glad alive. Glad to be alive. I'm yeah. glad to be alive. People laugh when I say that. Well, why? I, you know, do you, I don't think they're laughing at you. I think they're. I think that's a genuine response. To I hope so. What a great response they to ju- what I said. I thought it was just. I. I. I think there's some that, but some are like, "Wow, that's a weird answer." It's the truth. Well, I'm glad to be alive. You brother. know, there, there's some people that um, <laughs> they get sarcastic. So when you ask someone, and they say. 
How you doing? Living the dream, man. Yeah, living and the dream. And that's usually the opposite of what they mean. Yeah. You know yep. what I mean? Yep. Going so, through the nightmare. Yeah. So when you when you say I'm I'm grateful to be alive, I'm glad to be alive, mm-hmm. I think people are taken aback by that. And you probably have some cynics that are like, all right, whatever. Oh, whatever, dude. Yeah, oh, yeah. one of those guys. Yeah. <laughs> yeah right, well, that, right. that, was, that was the epiphany for me, Fitz. And then I came out and it, it, it was life altering. Yeah. Now, at the time, I was going to a counselor. At the time, it, I'm going to be honest with you. This is this is something I don't share with everybody, but it, 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 you know what? It's like going to a doctor. Mm-hmm. Unless you tell them the truth, nothing is going to change. No right. benefit, nothing productive. It was always 419, and I was always trying to find that extra minute. Mm-hmm. If you understand what I'm saying, do you know where I'm going? It was always just a minute away from being 420. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. That's how I was self medicating. Yeah. Okay. And um, I went to my counselor, and he go and he, knowing who I was, I am a hold myself accountable kind of guy, because if you hold yourself accountable, others won't have to. So I hold myself accountable. So knowing that, he would start the counsel. He wouldn't say, well, I think we should talk about this. He would say, what do you want to talk about? I said, what I want to talk about is I want to quit this habit. Mm-hmm. I don't. And again, I think you and I talked about this. I look at addiction differently than I, than than a lot of other people. But um, he said, why do you do it? Next time you go do it, ask yourself, why am I doing this? And I did that very night. Went, had it ready to go. I sat it down. And I said, why am I doing this? It was to escape everything else. That was the excuse I was using to get away from everything. I didn't need the mind alteration. I was using it as a reason to just get out of the house, get out of the noise. I was running away from my kids. At that exact moment, I decided I'm going to run to my kids, not away from my kids. I'm here for them. They're not here for me. Mm -hmm. We had the choice to have them. They didn't have the choice to be born. And they throw that in my face sometimes too, Fitz, a little brat. But uh, you know, like, I didn't choose to be here, Dad. But I'm just saying to build up to where we are, where I am now. That was yeah. part of the process. And then um, we moved past that and uh, built the relationship with my kids even stronger. We had meals at the dinner table every day until I became a mobile DJ, and then I was never home. But um, there you go. So. <laughs> That, that, that is that, that's kind of where we're at. So, a couple of takeaways that I have that yeah. I actually love. I'll let you talk. Why me? <laughs> well, I'm here for you. <laughs> why me? Changing why me to why not me. Yeah. That that. I mean, if that doesn't say everything about you right there, mm-hmm. I, I think that's, why not me, man. Yeah. And, and, and it's it's not it's it. There's no pretense with me. Fitz. Mm-hmm. I don't know if you figured that out or not. I'm going to shoot straight and I want you to shoot straight with me too. And, and part of that whole foundation is why not me? You know what I mean? I'm a, I'm a spiritual man. I'm a man of God. And, um, it's not like he said, Hey, I'm going to strike you down with this disease. I'm not afflicted with it. I don't suffer from it. Suffering is a choice. I don't suffer from it. I have it. I'm not afflicted by it. That's negative thinking. That's negative thinking, Fitz. So why not me? But thank you. What's the other takeaway? You said you had a couple of them. <laughs> we can be indifferent or we can make a difference. Yeah. I, I love those. I love those two phrases that you that it's, you just dropped on the blathering. That's why I'm the Monet monology, my brother. <laughs> no, that uh, that that... I'll tell you what, when we do these things, the time goes by so fast, doesn't it? It does. Um, it is. It's a choice. There's, there, you, you always have a choice, mm. okay? You can wake up on the wrong side of the bed or the right side of the bed. You can look at how bad things are going to go or you can look at how good things are going to go. You can uh, choose between happiness or crappiness. It's up to you, man, okay? When somebody says, how you doing? There's two ways to answer that. Eh, could be better. Or, hey, could be worse. Could be worse. Yeah, man. I love what you're throwing down, my friend. Right on. How can people find you if they want to hire you for all of your many talents? They can find me on Facebook. Just look up Spazman Simmons. They can find me on Twitter. They can write me at, uh, email me at spazmansimmons at yahoo.com. 
Spazman only has one Z. S P A Z M A N. There you go. Or just put pull out your GPS, type in awesomeness, and it'll take you right to my house. <laughs> <laughs> and on that note, Craig Spazman Simmons, thank you so much for joining me on the blathering. It's oh, been thanks, a pleasure. Thanks for having me, man. See ya. <laughs>